Hi, Michael Sankey here from Charles Darwin University. Uh, just a presentation I did at ACODE 90 the other day on new pedagogies that uh, are music to our ears, thanks to AI. First, of course, I would like to pay my respects uh, to the First Nations peoples from the land in which I'm coming from, the Larrakia land. And Charles Darwin University acknowledges all the First Nations people across the land in which we live and work. We pay respect to elders, both past and present. Well, we're considering AI and learning and teaching. Now, this of course affects all areas of learning and teaching now, as we think about the different types of teaching or the different types of technologies and the different types of approaches we have to learning and teaching. Of course, we've had books and interactives, readings, podcasts, videos, LMSs, e-portfolios, et cetera, for quite a while now in the online space. But now we're starting to think, how does AI affect these things? But I think probably most importantly over the last eight, 10 months has been the effects that it has had on assessment and this notion of authenticity that is present within our assessment, particularly if we do exams and essays and things like that. But of course, assessment is much greater than that. There are a whole lot of other things that are associated with assessment in higher education. However, what fundamentally underpins the way we approach our learning and teaching and assessment is this thing, things that we call pedagogies and different types of pedagogies that we use. And those pedagogies are informed by our epistemologies, that is the knowledge of things, the meaning of the ontology and the value of our, our axiology. Now, these things fundamentally go unnoticed to us in their day to day, but they do underpin the way we think about the pedagogies that we use in our learning and teaching, probably subconsciously. That is the knowing of, the meaning of, and the value of knowledge. The sequential or hierarchy development of knowledge to the qualitatively distinct stages students progress through that are culturally and contextually aligned with their ability to position this to their own discursive practice or social constructs, says Richardson. Ontologies, on the other hand, is the development of an educated self through an empathic, relational, intersubjective, where I fit in this discipline, that is sensitively and creatively attuned to the world through the application of contemplative educational pedagogy. That's how we make meaning, the pedagogy. And then there's the prescribed value or the, uh, the axiology, arguably some being intrinsic value, but that society and the higher education community believes important to do in higher education or what it should be like and what it contributes back. Now, what does that mean to assessment? So assessment can evaluate the process of inquiry as much as the product places more value on interpretive, contextual, and reflective learning. It may be continuous and programmatic, collaborative knowledge construction versus individual mastery to prioritize the manifestation of human qualities like creativity, productivity, ethics, critical thinking, and these become central. So we have this weird looking thing and these weird words that underpin fundamentally the way we approach learning and teaching. And what is AI and the emergence of generative AI in particular meant to these things? And how does it change these funny words? I would just like to propose a, a little metaphor here. We know that the world sits on these things called tectonic plates. And if we were to think that our pedagogies over the years have been these tectonic plates. What AI does is start to move some of these tectonic plates. And what happens when these tectonic plates move, of course, is we get earthquakes and, and things like that. And so they butt up against one another and they contest against one another for position. And in a sense, that's kind of what's happening now that AI has come along. We're now contesting in different spaces around learning and teaching and particularly around assessment. Where I am, 
uh, sitting down here in Australia is just near the Ring of Fire. And since I've been up in Darwin here uh, for the last two and a half years, I've probably, we've probably felt about four or five earth tremors over that time as these plates have moved along this Ring of Fire. But of course, disruption itself is not new, is it? Uh, we've had historical disruptions for ever. And so historical disruptions might be things like the uh, printing press that was in you know, back in 1499, first industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, and uh, artificial intelligence, of course, been around since about 1950. But more importantly, the internet and ICTs, about 1962, the, the massification of higher education and the fourth industrial revolution, and what some scholars would now think is the fifth industrial revolution, which are predominantly brought around by the uh, massification of AI. So what happened back in 19, and in, sorry, in 1760? Well, people started coming off the land and mass production started to happen and uh, factories grew and uh, the, the way in which things were created changed and different knowledges started to emerge around those things. The second industrial revolution predominantly was, was uh, caused with the advent of steel. And uh, so we could create steel boats and we could create light bulbs and telegraphs and things like that. So that was a fundamental change in the way we lived. Artificial intelligence, as I said, been around since about the 1950s. And you will have heard of what Alan, Alan Turning said back in 1950. I propose to consider the question can machines think? Question that we still question today, but are getting a little bit more clarity on. Of course, back in 1962, there was the first advent of the internet, Appranet, when it, there were four universities uh, in the US connected. Uh, data was transferred, not just telephones, but uh, data was, was sent across lines to these universities. And of course, in uh, 1989, Tim Berners-Lee launched the internet with an interface that allowed people much uh, easier access to this data and, the, and being able to visualize that data on the screen much easier. Now, that was the year before I started in universities. I started at the University of Southern Queensland in 1990, and we didn't get computers in the university for a few years after that. Then we had the massification of higher education. Now, this was huge for, for universities, particularly in Australia and clearly for overseas as well. But in Australia, in the year before I started at the University of Southern Queensland, there was only 7.9% of the Australian population had a degree. Now, over 50% of the population have degrees. And you see the way in which that grew over time. And that big bump at the end when the government, a few years prior to that, they put a lot of money into higher education to lift the uh, the productivity of society. So now 50.8% of the population uh, have a degree. A huge shift that was. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, some would say started about 2015 with ubiquitous mobile devices. So everybody having a, a smartphone, as it were. The Internet of Things. Uh, location detection technologies, advanced human machine interfaces, authentication and fraud detection, smart sensors, big analytics and advanced processes, multi-level customer interaction, customer profiling, augmented realities and wearables, and on-demand availability of computer systems and resources. Uh, and of course, we started to see some real big uh, visualization and uh, triggered live training and things using, using data. Of course, this picture is of robots doing the work in a factory. One of the problems, though, of course, we've we've got Gen AI now, of course, but we haven't fully come to terms with these things from the fourth industrial revolution in higher education. So we're kind of almost still playing catch up with that while we're also trying to deal with the next wave. So the fifth industrial revolution, uh, based around generative AI, uh, some scholars would say that that's what we're in right now. But it's not just about generative AI, it's also about a huge in 
uh, investment in sustainability, uh, human centeredness and concerns for the environment, and biotech, smart cells, biofuels, gene therapies, uh, collaborative robots known as cobots, uh, a transformation of industrial structures through, as we'll be talking about, AI, the Internet of Things, and of course, big and big data. So we come back to this this metaphor of the of the tectonic plates, but just to change the metaphor slightly at this point. So if we're thinking about pedagogies, I have my pedagogical golf clubs, which was an article I wrote a number of years ago a couple of years ago about putting the pedagogy course in front of the technology cart. And uh, I have my set of pedagogical golf clubs. I have my uh, pedagogies on the left-hand side there, my pedagogy, andragogy, hudagogy, paragogy. These are only, of course, some of them. Uh, and on the other side, my learning theories. It's on the left of the learning strategies, it's on the right of the learning theories, constructivism, socio-constructivism, situated learning and connectivism. And of course, that drives different forms of assessment and different forms of active, collaborative and authentic engagement teaching strategies. And it depends which club I'm going to use on any particular hole. So it will change. As I'm teaching, it will depend on my audience that I'm teaching to and with, and it will depend on the maturity of that audience. It will depend what tools I'm using within that audience as to what, ped what mix of these odgies and isms I put in place. However, all of a sudden, this new club came on the market, this titanium club. And I reckon if I got one of these clubs, I'd get at least an extra 20 metres on my swing. Wouldn't that be just fantastic? Of course, this is the club of choice now, isn't it? But unfortunately, that club costs $550. And so I've got to put some effort into getting that club <laughs> and of course this club if i carry through in this metaphor is ai and how i'm going to uh, apply this and how i'm going to get this into my practice so i want to add this club into my pedagogical bag so how am i going to do that what can generative ai do for us that we haven't been able to do before so we're going to look at some of these questions in just a minute does this usher in a new type of pedagogy, the AIOG? I'm just kidding, of course. How long do we wait? Do we kind of wait for it to merge? Will it emerge? Uh, the academy typically takes a while to warm up to these things. So can we get on the front foot with this? Can we start to theorise this now so we don't have to play catch up further down? And so I can get the extra 20 metres on my swing. Coming back to this metaphor then, let's say we have uh, the continents being our pedagogies or our practice, and the continents, of course, sit on top of these plates, and so that they're the things that sit above the water, and the continents are our pedagogies. But underneath those pedagogies sits these tectonic plates, aren't they? Those, those uh, axiologies and things like that. They, they sit beneath the surface. And they're what control what happens on top of the surface, maybe unconsciously. And so that informs our practice. Let's look then at epistemology, the knowledge of. And what does AI potentially do to epistemology and to the continent that sits above it? So we can see that knowledge is no longer solely constructed by human minds. Well, it kind of is and it kind of isn't. It's kind of uh, generated and collated together in these AI engines and we call on it by algorithms. But we do see a time when potentially uh, information itself can be generated. So what happens to the meaning and the content without human intention? There's an interesting thought which leads to challenging notions of humans as the only source of new knowledge. If algorithms can create new knowledges, they're not there yet, but we do need to understand that that may be the case. The role of educator shifts from knowledge transmitter to teaching critical evaluation. 
and contextualization of AI produced knowledge. So more focus on information literacy. And that's where we're at right now. We're really trying to uh, get our students to understand where we're at with AI and the information that comes from AI and how they can be literate around this information. And of course, we're doing that with our teaching staff as well. Students need to learn how to effectively harness AI uh, as a collaborative partner uh, in their learning, in their life, and also in their work. Rather than relying on it, we need to partner over it. So I'm just to continue this notion of epistemology and the, the knowledge of, we see a greater emphasis may emerge on the limits of artificial intelligence knowledge and the uniquely human skills of critical analysis and creativity. And of course, ethics and qualitative judgment. Because AI, of course, generative AI will only reproduce things that are within its knowledge bank. Whereas we can, as humans, extend that knowledge through analysis, critical analysis, and creativity, productivity. The criteria for assessing knowledge and truth claims may need to evolve uh, to judge the credibility and variability of AI systems along with traditional notions of scholarly rigor. Now, I have put quite a bit of text in these slides, you will see, and I am speaking to it. This is because the presentation may be seen without my voiceover. And so those who read this presentation will get a sense of what's happening. So uh, I'm not apologizing. I'm just telling you why there's so much text in these slides. There will be a greater transparency needed around this stuff because we know that the algorithms at this point are biased. So we know that a lot of the knowledge that sits within these databases is biased from decades of, of, of uh, knowledge that's been created. So we know just like tech, some textbooks are biased, some writings are biased, a lot of the stuff on the internet is biased. Uh, so we understand that the outputs of generative AI may also be biased. And so we also need to, in some sense, control that through policy and debates around copyright, intellectual freedom, and particularly around the commodification of that knowledge and where that sits. We are now going to swing to ontology. And that is the meaning that's made out of these things. So what happens to the meaning of work? Uh, we see that the commercial adoption of generative AI has changed many companies and the way they operate. Uh, we've seen the rise of new roles and prompt engineers and vector database developers and people like that. There's this fear that it's going to replace a whole lot of jobs. That's not been seen at this point and is unlikely to be seen in great numbers. There will be changes to some jobs, but ultimately we will find new roles uh, to be productive using generative AI. It's a sense of the learner's sense of self. And this needs to evolve and to encompass all different types of hybrid identities as AI does provide extensions and augmentations of human cognition. The boundaries of individual agency and identity may blur because of this. There is this notion of what's the meaning of the physical presence. It may become less central on learning uh, if AI tutors, for example, come into being and provide robust virtual interactions at a point of need. And we're starting to see that already through tools like Grammarly AI and things like that, where it's, it's providing a, a conversation with students, the, the chatbots, as it were. Notions of the classroom as a, as a spatial locus may also evolve uh, as we diffuse our learning networks. What about the originality and authorship? Well, with easy AI content generation, these things do get called into question and are redefined. And we shifting our, as we shift our learners through critical text contextualization rather than just pure knowledge construction. So instead of knowledge construction is what you do with that knowledge in a creative ways. Continuing on with ontology, the meaning of, let's look at the role of the lecturer. And of course that may evolve and will evolve from SAGE. And we've seen it many 
for many years, moving away from the sage on the stage to more facilitator and curator, as AI, of course, will handle a lot of the knowledge delivery. And that does allow us as academics and teachers to spend more time on coaching and mentoring and giving formative feedback and things like that. So with easy access to global AI knowledge, the primary and privileging of certain texts, cultures and pedagogies may diminish in favour of diversity. That would be good. As generative AI permeates education, what happens to our institutions? Well, we may need to clarify the distinctly human skills learners should acquire and provide rich interactions that foster some of these things. We now switch to that third element, that axiology, the value of education uh, within and the value of knowledge, and particularly what is uniquely human in these things. The greater focus on cultivating uniquely human skills like creativity, critical thinking, empathy, ethics will emerge, not could emerge, they need to emerge. These could be valued over factual knowledge uh, because it's going to be so easy to get that through AI. More emphasis will need to be placed on the social emotional aspects of learning to balance increased technical mediation, which is caused by these AI systems and the moral frameworks. What are the value of our moral frameworks here? Well, through developing strong moral fra frameworks, we can judge responsible versus irresponsible use of AI. And this may become a key to our educational outcomes. To finish off axiology, with it being so easy to generate new content now, maybe it's we're gonna be looking at process focus values like effort, and grit and persistence. These might need to have a renewal in emphasis, uh, particularly around the validation of the knowledge that's generated. And the value of, we're still talking about the value of finding meaning, purpose and fulfillment. So as automation increases through these things, it may require cultivating passions beyond academic career success. Of course, more focused on on what the graduate is going to be doing and preparing those people for that. With these augmented capabilities, we may need to reinforce some of these ethical counterbalances around humanity and perspective to allow our students to uh, put this into these new perspectives that haven't necessarily been uh, uh, promoted over the years. And of course, prioritizing accessibility, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we've done a lot of talking about that over recent years. It's really risen to the fore and will grow and keep growing in importance uh, as we seek to ensure benefits for all our students through the use of generative AI. So we don't want to see an us and them uh, appearing because people can't access or make use of this in their learning and teaching. So there are ethical things we need to think around about this particularly around valuing diversity uh, and diverse identities and cultures and uh, the ways of knowing uh, to counter the homogenizing tendencies of AI. Because if we, if we just relied on AI, we're going to get the same types of outputs all the time. This is why we need to bring in these other factors. A couple of things to consider now. We know that large language models are not in themselves agents at this point. So they don't think for themselves. They do still need a human to uh, create meaning with them. Uh, you know, ultimately, they're just repositories of data waiting for a human to prompt them with, with questions, at which point an algorithm is enacted. So that's fine. Uh, however, the notion of joint agency is on the table. That is the human machine. And it will emerge. Uh, and this would fundamentally change our long-standing epistemologies, axiologies, and, and things like that. So the assumptions we have around knowledge and value, but we're not there yet. Uh, and it would change the meaning of knowledge and how we deal with knowledge. Uh, it would then reside in a different place, uh, you know, what, what appears to be versus what really is the case. So this is 
something on the horizon, but not something to be scared of because we are moving towards that and we'll theorise that as we come towards that. What we are concerned about now, though, is making music with the AI that we do have. So let's sing a song of pedagogy and understand what this means to our pedagogies as we move forward. Let's think now about the implications for our traditional pedagogy. So meaning may not be made just through discrete chunks or episodes or units or subjects. Rather, we probably need to be thinking about course-wide assessment and the linking of knowledge across units of study rather than in these discrete chunks that we've been dealing with for years. We probably need to think about peer learning and assessment a bit more uh, to follow on from this. And together, where together we make meaning and sense of information. Uh, so as our students work through the implications of AI together and create meaning together uh, and testing its accuracy and relevance. I think we do need to take a stance of test everything. Uh, and we've seen that through a lot of the fake news and deep fakes that are now out there. We know that uh, people can be replicated and be made to say things that they didn't normally say, wouldn't have said. As we put new lenses across this information, such as ethics and gender appropriateness, political inferences and things like that, we need to be questioning everything that we're coming uh, that is coming from generative AI. We do know that some of these tools fantasize and that don't always give us a fully accurate picture. I found that myself when testing ChatGPT and other tools, that the information they give me sounds good on the surface, but when I uh, interrogate it more, it's not as good as it could be. And so we do need to recognize though the original input versus generated content, but that's getting harder and harder with things like app smashing and things like that. That is app smashing is when you would take a, an output from generative AI, from ChatGPT, for example, put it into something like Grammarly and then take that and put it into Quillbot or another app. So by the time it goes through those apps, it's actually honed out pretty well. Uh, we do need to also think about the rise of alternate ways of representing knowledge. That is with the, with the oral and visual forms uh, that allow us to create knowledge and represent knowledge in different ways. Some of those things are not quite as easy done by generative AI at the moment. This, this notion of AI marking is, is certainly coming to the fore pretty quickly. It's certainly gonna free up academics time, uh, but may provide more time for them to help co-create with their students and to maybe provide more formative feedback uh, to their students on their assessments, but to engage with the students in different ways if the same pressures aren't there. So that's a, that's a positive, of course. Uh, we do have to consider the ethical implications of some of that as well. So some of the implications for traditional pedagogies continue in terms of the rise that we need to see in self-regulated learning. That is, that learning is designed to equip students to pilot their way through the intricacies of the AI-regulated environments. I suppose one of my dreams is that we simulate and borrow from real world scenarios. I mean, we've, of course, we've done that in, in limited ways over the years. But are there businesses willing to partner with us to share their live experiences, maybe even with cameras in the workplace and watching real time work is happening? Can students inter, interact with this virtually? Uh, not just in the physical, but also in the virtual space. I'm not thinking XR, I'm thinking more augmented reality. Uh, where students are potentially contributing into a live workplace uh, through, through the technologies that we now have. We think also that explicit skills and creativity will become more. And we know in the Australian context that the government is keen to see the notion of skills become part of higher education as well. So not just the vocational education, but also that students are far more aware of the skills that they are attaining as they are doing their higher education studies. That, of course, linked with creativity, uh, where we can say, okay, well, from this and from here, 
this is what we should be able to do. So using the AI tools to base us, to give us a grounding from which we then can be more productive and more creative with what we have. In essence, we're seeing that assessments may need to judge how learners are weaving together AI uh, and, and, and putting that together with human outputs to demonstrate the growth of this co-creation of knowledge that I've just been talking through. Well, of course, there are the risks and the biases of AI, and we and we need to be vigilant around this as well and have good governance structures around this within our institutions. In terms of assessment, authentic assessment, I, I've written about this recently. I'm not going to prosecute this argument here other than to say that I did write this article very recently in terms of authentic assessment in the age of generative AI, and I would encourage you to access that. How is this going to affect the academy? And what benefits could there be from AI for the academy? Well, AI can help facilitate more project problem, project and problem-based assessments and evaluate real-world skills versus test-taking. AI could generate more personalised assessment tasks, tailored on each student's progress, particularly when linked with the data and the insights that we might have around some of the strengths and weaknesses of our students. Now, we of course need to be careful with that data and have systems that we know are secure where the institution looks after that data. It's not held out in some third party on the web and that's all possible now. So A, we know that there are new chatbots out there that can be run on Azure. And so, and that is within our domain and so as we implement those chatbots, we can start to train them with student data and train them to understand uh, what students may need to help themselves to, to uh, be able to create assessments that are more targeted and to see them uh, provide, uh, be given opportunities. We find that it gives us opportunities to provide students with pathways to finding their knowledges that will help them towards their careers. AI can piece together multiple modes of evidence also. So not just writing, but it can piece together speech and, and visuals and codes if we're doing coding. And that can help to develop a comprehensive learner profile for our staff and for our support staff and vice versa for our students. AI can also help produce large question banks and for proctoring and quizzes and things like that. So instead of producing 20 questions for a quiz, quiz maybe it's 80 questions or 100 questions that the quiz bank is working from. So AI can help us create those, uh, those large question banks. And those question banks can be targeted at some of the students' weak points. So it actually helps them to build that knowledge. So not just quizzes to test knowledge, but quizzes to build knowledge. However, Student biometric and performance data is really sacred. Uh, we can't be putting that data out onto the generative AI, openly available generative AI tools. We must uh, think about the student's privacy and the ethics around this. And so these need, these need addressing and uh, need to be dealt with by the institutions. What about staff and student interactions? Well, we need to be having the open discussions around academic integrity and the responsibility of using AI. Uh, and so we should be doing this at the very start of every unit or subject that we teach. Let's explain the rules around and the expectations, make it clear to them the way in which you anticipate that they would use AI when they're doing their study. But in doing that, we also provide opportunities to use it openly, you know, to help us brainstorm in class, for example, uh, maybe for drafting content, but we're asking our students to cite and disclose when they're using generative AI. Uh, that's a really that's really important. It's a point of no shame for our students. Let's encourage our students to thoroughly review and edit anything that's generated from generative AI uh, before they submit, of course, uh, not to use it verbatim. I've used uh, Claude 2 to help pull some points together for this presentation. I didn't just take the points from Claude 2. I used them just to provide me a structure to help think about the types of points I should address. 
I didn't use the content other than the structure that it gave me. And so I've done that and I'm declaring it openly that I've done that. Uh, similarly, the students need to be able to do that as well. So it may also mean that we get our students to submit preliminary notes and drafts. Now, it doesn't mean you have to review all those preliminary, those preliminary documents, but they're there if there's some question that you might have around their work. So if, if they've submitted something and you think, oh, no, they've just, they've just cut and pasted this from generative AI, if there's preliminary notes and drafts that are provided as well, then you can see that there might have been a journey towards this. What does it do around student and staff interactions? Well, have students reflect on the process of working with generative AI, what they found useful, what they found were the limitations, how it augmented their efforts in different ways. We probably do need to still be avoiding high stakes related testing, uh, exams, online exams and things like that, where the temptation is really high to cheat. And we've seen a number of universities experience quite dramatic rises in cheating behaviours that have been publicly reported. Uh, so in that, we need to consider you know, more project-based and collaborative work as we've been talking through. Have students maybe, if there is work that's uh, more of a written nature, get them to sign some kind of integrity statement, clarifying proper AI use and claiming full responsibility for the submission. So declaring what has been done and when. That's, you know, let's focus on educating students on the responsible use of AI as a skill in itself to foster creativity and critical thinking. We need to help support our academic staff by working with them to develop foundational knowledge about how these different AI technologies work and their capability and limitations. To give us a, we need to move from this, this hype to reality of how we're going to be using these tools. There has this been over the last 10 months, this, wow, what do we what do we got here? It's now time for us to start moving towards a realistic use of these tools within our environments. This does mean that we you know, have and will be reviewing our course learning objectives, assessments, the content and different activities. Uh, you know, we need to identify those areas where AI could augment or replace certain elements uh, and where the human experience is irreplaceable. So let's dip our toes in the water with maybe some small experiments incorporated some select AI tools. Doesn't have to be chat GPT, it be other tools into our courses, particularly in the in low stakes ways to start with. So like using a chat bot to practice questions or, or plagiarism and checks or drafts that build these, build on these experiences. So start small and work up. Again, better more support for academics would be through helping them connect with their peers at the department level and conferences and things like that to discuss ways that uh, they and we are thoughtfully adopting AI. So far, most have been willing to collaborate and share ideas. And I think we do see that across the sector very happily. From an institutional perspective in this and supporting our academics, we need to be pushing for decisions around AI adoption and making sure that the, uh, we are all on the same page and involve faculty within that. Uh, we need to be doing that through our professional development activities. Uh, you know, the, the human AI complementarity rather than just purely replacing something. Uh, it's about complementing what we currently do with these functionalities. But of course, in that we're centering on our core educational values like critical thinking, learner agency, ethics and inclusion as we experiment with AI applications to guide our responsible adoption of these tools. I suppose though, at the end of the day, if I am considering epistemology and the ontology and the axiology, when I'm thinking about reconstructing learning and teaching in this age of generative AI, I then think, oh, okay, well, what are the implications of all this on our pedagogies? Well, to do that, I printed out a whole lot of readings and got a whole lot of readings online and read through them. And I processed this in my mind. And you know what? 
I came out with this presentation. But in all of this, let's not forget the agency of the human GPT. And finally, here are the references that I used uh, for this presentation. I hope you find this helpful.